So Vermintide 2 has a series of downloadable contents that are somewhat planned or are in some sort of roadmap uh, that was supposed to come out around this time, around April, but we, we all know how game developers' roadmaps kind of, it's one of the, that saying that goes, you know, no plan kind of uh, stays intact once it makes contact with the enemy. And, and the same can really be said about a lot of game, game developers and their roadmaps once they, uh, once they actually release the game. So we do know that some of the DLC things that are coming out for Vermintide 2 include map packs. It was all the rage in Vermintide 1. We, uh, what was it, like, like eight or nine total map packs? They even released a map pack a month before Vermintide 2 came out. So you know that Fat Shark is going to be given the goodies when it comes to potential map packs and, and the such. But one thing I want to talk about today, and one thing that, that has, was never the norm, in Vermintide 1, and this is purely speculation, it's just, hey, this would be a really cool choice for this DLC. And this is a new character, a new a new hero selection, as it were. Well, we've already got five heroes uh, all ready to choose from, and they're great, you know, they, and especially adding the, the uh, three variants of each hero, you know, you, you technically, you really have 15 total heroes to play from. Um, that, that's really stretching things because it's, they're all kind of working out the same archetype. So what I want to talk about today is a Bretonian character. Uh, Vermintide 2 takes place, or Vermintide 1 and 2 both take place in, in the end times, uh, right around the around the mid, to, right about the very end of the Bretonian Civil War in the end times. So it would make a lot of sense that Bretonia might send some of its knights over to the Empire to help out. So let's talk about those, the, the Bretonian archetype, was, well, I guess we'll call it, and then the three hero selections, or three hero su archetype uh, subclasses, I guess you could you could then spur from that. So, we, we, we then have to take a look at the, the lore of each one of these subtypes as well. So let's start out with the, the questing knight. And this would make the most sense, right? So, a questing knight is an individual who has taken up the questing vow. He is a Bretonian Knight of the Realm that has taken up the questing ballad, that is. And he basically imparts on the quest to find the Grail. The Grail of the Lady, if you're familiar with Total War Warhammer, of course, and the way they're uh, French. And this, this questing vow kind of takes him all across Middle-earth, I mean uh, uh, the Old World, <laughs> um, in fighting all manners of beasts, large and small, uh, rescuing damsels in distress, defending churches, any manner of quest that, that the questing knight feels would put him closer to attaining the grail. And the grail is not a physical um, chalice hidden somewhere in a treasure chest that they kind of uh, open up the, the, the doors to it and, oh look, it's, it's been waiting there the whole time, you know, you chose poorly, like it was fucking Indiana Jones, but it's not like that at all. In fact, the questing knight, essentially when they have completed their questing vow, they are granted a vision from the Lady of the Lake. And this is when they essentially find the spiritual grail. And drinking from this, they become uh, what, the, what the book literally calls living saints. And they ascend to grail knights, which is going to be our second subclass. And then from grail knights, they are essentially uh, tasked with... It, it's less of a... The, the grail knights are honestly a fighting force in Bretonia that is sitting, waiting around. They are pretty much in charge of defending holy places that are sacred to the lady, or holding down certain locations, or doing what they can to benefit the faith of the lady. And in a lot of the ways, they're, they're almost like warrior monks. They're, they're, they're very reserved when not actively at war. And when roused to battle, of course, they are these living incarnations of the lady, and, and, and uh, the, these saints that they kind of bring magic, and they bring all sorts of... Uh, holiness to the battlefield in a way that you would see the, the archetypical paladin of, say, a Dungeons and Dragons. So that the, those are the two main uh, subtypes I want to work with today, and we'll talk about the third one as it's kind of like a cool grand reveal, and it's going to fit the kind of motif of, of the other races. But let's talk about the questing knight. So with each one of these, these heroes, we've got three crucial things, and this is what I've boiled it down to. Um, I want to give a real quick shout out to Indie Pride from uh, Milk and Cookies Total War. Uh, he kind of helped me get my brain in the right place for a lot of these ideas because Indie Pride has definitely played Vermintide 2 a lot more than me and he has a really good idea of uh, what makes more sense mechanically than I do. So he really helped me kind of flesh this out. So if you haven't gotten a chance to take a look at Indie Pride, 
from Milk Foods Total War, please head on over to his channel. I'll set up put a link below. But let's talk about the three things. These three key differentiators, I guess you want to say, if I'm talking business terms, um, are their weapons, their active ability, their ultimate, as it were, and then their passive ability. So let's talk about those weapons. And the Questing Knight, if we, if we take a look at the Questing Knight from lore, they're always on horseback with a great weapon in hand. Um, they have a weird like luggage on the back of their horse with a bunch of weird like rail relics and the such. And then they have a shield on their back. So how would the Grail Knight work? Would he be a class that it, that is just strictly two-handed? I mean, what kind of range mechanics are you going to have and so on and so forth? So this is what I think is going to happen. W w this is what I think would happen in this case. Um, Bretonian knights don't use ranged weapons. The yeomen do, uh, the peasants do, but they do not. It's unchivalrous to even consider it. Uh, they maybe do it in, in tournaments and the such, but there, there are very few lords and the such that, that commit to using bows. And there's, there's little things here and there in previous editions where uh, you could actually have a, a bowman be part of the your, your an actual knight bowman, but let's just assume that that's not the case. So this doesn't fit the role of a questing knight. So, in all three of these iterations, these these subtypes of the Bretonian knight, um, I'm going to say that they would not have no ranged abilities. Instead, they would have maybe something different, something along the lines of let's say. Uh, we look at the Dwarf Slayer. The Dwarf Slayer can take two main weapons. You know, they can have their dual axes or a two-handed axe, stuff like that. So maybe the Grail Knight or the Questing Knight can't take a ranged weapon whatsoever, but they can maybe take like a chalice, something that is uh, something to, to buff up those around them or give them a passive aura, almost in the same sense as we see in a lot of Paladin roles. And again, archetypical Paladin across D&D, World of Warcraft, any, even the Warcraft series as a whole. Anytime you look at Paladins, you think of just like some sort of aura that helps out. So maybe that, that is their, their range slot. Is maybe rather than an actual another weapon, they just get something like that. Or, hear me out on this, um, they get something along the lines of uh, just an, a, a second passive ability, some of that sort, where they don't actually have, there's just an X in that box where there would be something they could take, and they just have uh, another passive ability that they work with that is always running in conjunction. Something of that sort. I'm not really sure how that would work out, and I'll be totally honest with you guys. The biggest hurdle in, in talking about the, these three options has been their weapons, because the weapons are so... I hate to say this, but the Bretonian weapons are very bland. Uh, they have access to Morning Stars and Maces more so than other races in the Warhammer universe. But no, the, no other race. I'm sorry, no other hero has not used a weapon that they would use. You know what I mean? So it's like, oh, they, maybe they use flails and Morning Stars more. Well, Saltspire uses flails too. Ugh. And Eddie probably brought up a good point where, you know, Saltspire and. Um, the, the Empire Captain both use two-handed swords, and so does Krellian. But Krellian uses it in more of a thrusting manner, whereas the other two use it in more of a slashing manner. So maybe that's a mechanic that would come in. So the way I would look at the Questing Knight's weapons would be that it's two-handed weapons of all shapes and sizes. You know, you've got your two-handed axes, your two-handed swords, maybe a large two-handed mace as well, like a large morning star or a large two-handed flail that's more um, AOE, uh, crowd control centric, something of the sort. But here's a kind of a cool little mechanic I thought of that I think would be pretty interesting for the questing knight. Since they do carry a kite shield on their back, what if their block, rather than being, rather than them raising their two-handed weapon up and having a, a moderate to low stamina and the ability to have their stamina broken quickly, they have a longer animation time to block, and they actually sling their shield up from over behind their back to block the attack. So basically, you have a you have a you have an option as a gameplay style. Do you want to be 100% aggressive, or do you want to be able to be somewhat aggressive then use the time to block the long animation to block to be a little more defensive? So you kind of it makes the questing knight. Just less of like, okay, how do I just click this button as fast as I can? And more of a, how do I control the battle or or be present in the battle enough to know when I have to really hunker down to get that shield out to really block some serious attacks. So it allows your character to have that ability to be both um, aggressive and, and defensive. And um, that kind of brings us perfectly into his ultimate. And the ultimate, I think, would be something where... If, if I want to say, and just to let you know, uh, if I want to say the Questing Knight is going to be very 
not is not as party oriented or support oriented as the Grail Knight. I want to say the Questing Knight is very upfront. Let's do damage, or let's be in a position where I can keep doing damage. Um, I think all of their abilities have to have some sort of either support or defensive role. Even though the, the Questing Knight, I, I would I would imagine to be a little bit more of a offensive of the three roles. Um, I, I would want the, their their ultimate to kind of fit that overall Bretonian motif, that that Paladin motif. So. Maybe the, the questing knight's ability, maybe it's gaze of the lady, or so we'll call it, you know, the, the, ge the lady looks upon me and I, I'm filled with vigor. And it grants a self-heal to the questing knight and then an immunity to ranged damage. And, and part of the, part of the lore, the uh, blessing of the lady would, would impart some immunity to ranged damage. So that's what I think would be kind of a, a, nif a nifty thing is to kind of give that little, that little, okay, I'm being pinned down by rattling guns. I personally don't have any ranged attacks because I'm a questing knight, but I, I'm, I'm low on health. Boom, I'll pop my ult. I will get immunity to range damage for a brief amount of time, maybe 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 seconds, around there, 5 to 10. And then a, a quick shot of self-heal on top of his passive, which would be called the questing value, the questing Vow. They, they have the uh, the knight's vow, the questing vow, and the grail vow. Also the peasant's vow um, for each one of the knights of the realm, respectively. So the questing vow would be his passive, which would be uh, a constant stamina regen um, in an aura around him. Uh, maybe that maybe that would fall into the chalice. I'm not really sure how that would work, but that pat that stamina regen would make sure that he would be always constantly in fit enough shape to constantly be. Um, blocking or and constantly swinging as much as possible because I think that stamina regen maybe also has some form of uh, sprint reduction or I'm sorry uh, sprint increase so maybe he can close the gap quickly to do as much damage as possible and this questing knight is someone that's going from place to place town to town and hunting these monsters I thought of it I thought of the original incarnation of of the questing knight's special ability was maybe just a massive damage buff and like kind of like an AoE stamina uh, reward for everyone but I kind of like the idea of, of each one of their special abilities being somewhat defensive or, or kind of oriented towards the party. And that's what I wanted to, to go with for the, uh, the, the ultimate for the questing knight. That kind of squares away our questing knight, but let's talk about the, the other side of that coin, the more defensive role for what a Bretonian character might look like. And again, guys, 100% conjecture, pulling stuff out of my ass rapid fire right now. Um, but I, I got some grounding at least. At least I know the lore enough to, to know what I'm talking about. But let's talk about the Grail Knight. Now the Grail Knight, um, this is going to be a, definitely a sword and board type character. You're going to have maybe, a, again, a Morning Star, which I, I, I would look at as like an, a high AP um, sweeping attack. Not like it's not going to have any real thrusting ability. I would look at it as just kind of being able to sweep across and knock a lot of um, armored units around um, with a, a shield of sword. Maybe that Maybe the big thing with the Grail Knight is that their shield is a different shield than it is for, say, the Iron Breaker or the Empire Captain. It's that it, it takes, it has reduced stamina reduction, or maybe the things that would normally break a shield outright or knock a character over. Uh, it doesn't affect the Grail Knight as much. It's maybe just called a Holy Shield or Holy Aegis, something of the sort where they they are just the paragon of standing there with their shield up and just taking the beating, and. Again, kind of going off of what Indy Prime was telling me about how the two-handed weapon works with uh, Salt Spire versus a Corellian. Maybe the sword shield mechanic or, or sword and board, however you want to cut that, axe, sword, morning star, mace, uh, flail, again, it's a one-handed flail with a, with a shield to get more crowd control in there, or sword to get more AP or uh, stabbing damage, whatever you want to do it. But maybe the shield bash is included in the attack animation. So if you're just left clicking in the, in the such and using directional left click to kind of get different attacks going, maybe your it, your one and two, your left and your just your, your first two clicks are your shield bashing out then bashing back in to kind of sweep enemies away from you and smash them again with your shield. So it does light AoE damage and then your actual third attack is a thrust and the fourth attack is a thrust. So you're just getting like bash bash which is a sweep attack and then thrust thrust. So you you have a, a Grail Knight that is good at knocking around large packs of weak enemies, but not doing them a lot of damage, maybe one at a time with his thrusts. But he's good at really focusing down heavily armored one 
on one special unit. So he like, okay, maybe the uh, Chaos Warrior comes at him and he's a little bit more adept at taking that down because he can just thrust into the, into the neck or the grill or something like that. Uh, we could kind of get into the point where we could talk more about maybe the fact that he, maybe any all of these weapons are on fire, they're holy weapons, so maybe they do more AP damage, or any chaos, anything, cultists, spawns, anything like that, take increased damage from the Grail Knight. That's another option I really thought about, and I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on, on, on that, if that's what you kind of think would be a cool idea. But let's talk a little bit about his ultimate. So, here's a really cool idea I, I thought of. In fact, all my ideas are cool, I'm the best, holy shit. But, seriously, a really cool ultimate I think would, that would work for a Grail Knight is, you know, again, you have this paragon of, of defense, of, of standing up for other people, of always being the person who steps in front of the proverbial bullet is a Grail Knight, you know? So what if his ultimate, rather than just being a typical charge like we see for a handmaiden or for uh, the Emperor Captain, Empire Captain, uh, he, actually char he actually would charge to an ally and defend them. And this is actually more pertains to someone that's downed. So let's say you're in the middle of a, a, a swarm, tons of shit everywhere, and one of your allies gets downed. Let's just say Salt Spire for, for this, this instance. Well, the Grail Knight can charge to Salt Spire and immediately get him up. So that would be a really cool alt, I think, that would work in a mechanic that is very befitting of a defensive support role that the Grail Knight kind of fits, I think. I think it really kind of fits true with that and also at the same time delivers a mechanic that is not in the game at all in any way, but not too crazy. I think that a charge with an instant pop-up would be really, really strong and beneficial, especially as you try to push these harder, harder, harder difficulties where getting knocked down is pivotal at wrong points. So this kind of, this, this is almost like a way to uh, create a safety net in, in harder difficulties, I think. I think it'd be really cool. I think it'd be really different at least. But let's talk about that passive as well. You know, the Grail Vows, what we'll call that passive. Um, I, I don't really know what we'll call the uh, the ultimate for the Grail Knight. Let's just call it, I don't know, Blessing of the Lady, uh, the Wings of the Lady, the, the Chalice the chalice Doth Poureth Over, I'm not sure. <laughs> this is all having fun anyway, so name it what you want. Uh, but I think they're really cool passive for the Grail Knight. And again, to fit this role that we have kind of catered for him is a curse resist, like a 33% curse resist, if, if not an outright curse resist. Maybe everyone in the, in the, in the party is going to suffer curse except for him no matter what. So if, you, if you're pushing on tomes and you're pushing on um, grimoires, the grimoires won't affect him outright as far as curse goes. And I think that that is something that is really strong in this game. I think any trinket, trinket with curse resist on it is almost you know, 10 times more valuable than one without it. But I think that having that as a passive and freeing up that trinket is really huge for a character that is so focused on defense, like a Grail Knight, I think, would be. Or again, maybe the Grail Knight is a little more offensive with all these holy magic weapons, and I, and I have this totally pegged wrong. So, again, I maybe mean, you guys see him as more of a holy Avenger than a holy, like, um, you know, beastly tank. <laughs> but let me know what you think on that. So, here's the last role. And let's take a look at the roles for all of the other heroes to get an idea of where my head's at, right? So we look at the dwarf. The dwarf gets an ironbreaker and a ranger. You know, very, very opposites as far as like a ranged, ranged character with a with a 200 axe versus say an ironbreaker with prototypically a um, I'm sorry, archetypically with a uh, axe and shield or hammer and shield. You know, your 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 consummate tank. Then you've got your Slayer, which is a, a different part of the Dwarf lore, very important, very different character class. Same thing with Corellian. You've got your Waywatcher, then your Handmaiden, then Shade, so different. Unchained, so different. Zealot, pretty similar, but again, different mechanically. So what I think would be really amazing, and it fits really well into the Bretonian lore, is a Blood Knight. So you have a Questing Knight. He uh, finds the Grail, becomes a Grail Knight. Grail Knight eventually challenge, gets challenged by a blood knight, a blood dragon vampire, if you want to even look at it like that way, because the way it's supposed to fucking be. <laughs> Not bitter at all, 6th edition. Um, comes across a blood knight and, and loses, but puts up such a good fight that the, that the blood knight turns him. And by turning him, he becomes, you know, this unholy avenger of wrath. And here's the way I kind of have this kind of pegged. And this is, this is very different. Very, very different. So the range slot... 
maybe this plays into the whole chalice thing with the previous two, the range slot would be what I would call a white sword, W-I-G-H-T, like white king and such. And that sword is only usable during the Blood Knight's ultimate. And that sword is gonna be an entirely different looking sword. It's carried on his back, it's just completely like sheathed and, and different, but you know, what the hell's gonna, what, what the fuck's gonna be that? That sword looks cool. So let's say then this white sword would, would do any number of special abilities pertaining specifically to that sword and only when that sword's active. So maybe those these abilities are a little bit more OP. Maybe that every single slash is a huge sweeping cleave or maybe um, <clears throat> it has like a stomp ability that knocks things down. I don't know. The white sword itself would just be something that'd be a little bit different. So the Blood Knight in and of himself would be kind of, would maybe take from the, the same um, weapon weapons as the questing in the Grail Knight maybe a little bit heavier on the two-handed weapons and say the uh, sword and board but again there were blood dragon vampires with sword and board in the lore as well as tabletop and models so i think the blood i can really pick and choose what it wants to be but what i think the biggest thing is is going to be its ultimate and the ultimate is going to work around a mechanic that is entirely different so i'm going to call the ultimate blood fury because it's 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 boring and it's just, and it's the same thing you would expect for any vampire but it's still Hang out with me on this one. So Blood Fury, the, the ultimate bar is no longer gonna be bright blue. It's gonna be bright red. And it, it's gonna build as you do damage. And if you do, if you do, I, I'm, I'm torn between as you do damage or killing blows. Let's just say killing blows for sake of argument because I'm killing blows a little bit more umph. As you do killing blows, it builds the, uh, the Blood Fury. And as you build the Blood Fury, once you the gauge is completely full, you can activate it. Once you activate Blood Fury, your Blood Knight, you know, unsheathes his white sword, lets out a bellow, and everything that's not a special is feared, which is not a mechanic in this game, but I want to add it for this because I think it, I think fear and terror are such a huge part of not just Warhammer, but the way Skaven it react and um, deal with the rest of the world. It's mainly fear. <laughs> so you can fear all non-specials. They all run away. He's immune, he has increased damage and movement speed. So basically he just kind of goes into a crazy fury, which is befitting of a blood dragon vampire, who is someone who is like the pinnacle of martial prowess and just goes to town swiping and killing and destroying everything in his wake. And that's something I think would be really cool. So it, what, if, what if we did have this sort of uh, 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 bloodlust ability almost more or less. And, and, and a fear mechanic on top of it. Two very different things that I think would be very cool and, dif and differential in a game that needs something different if they were to add a six class, because I think the five that are in right now do so much already in such a cool way. Um, but I guess rounding out the Blood Knight here, we can talk about his possible passive, which is what I'm gonna call Legacy of Abhorash. In the lore, Abhorash, after he left Neferata and, and Morkane thereafter, uh, he kind of traveled the world looking to see, looking to find a way to end his vampirism. His, and Abhorash, for those of you who don't know, is the the very first blood dragon vampire. And the, and the blood dragon vampires are a, are a lineage that stems from Abhorash. Abhorash is this amazing, one of the, one of the most sound uh, military fighters in the entirety of the Warhammer universe. And not just in the Warhammer universe in the way that they say in every single army book, like this is the best fighter in the world. He is truly one of the best fighters of, of legend. And in the end times, at the very end, we see Gilles Le Breton, the, the Green Knight and former original ruler of Britannia, or Britannia, or Britannia, Britannia, I'm sticking with that. And the remainder of the Grail Knights with Abhorash uh, fighting uh, things off to the death. They were all allied together because the Blood Knights and the, and the Grail Knights kind of came together in this amazing moment and just like, one of the very few times in, in end times you're like, yeah, my nipples aren't hard and disappointed. <laughs> Or are hard and not disappointed. But Legacy of Abhorash would kind of follow the suit of Abhorash's ultimate lore, where he went about challenging monsters and, and people to try and cure his vampires. Not, he didn't challenge them to cure it. He tried to, he, he was always putting his martial skills to the test. And eventually he climbed one of the tallest mountains and slayed a dragon. And by doing this, he drank the dragon's blood after fighting for a day and a night. And by drinking the dragon's blood, he cured his vampires. And that's why they're called blood dragon vampires, blood knights. And 
That's what I think would be cool is what if this passive legacy of Abhorash meant in the very same way that Saltspire has, if you target it, if you, uh, you know, highlight a special unit, you get a damage bonus against it. Um, it's, it's kind of a way of saying like, okay, I'm going to challenge that special, special unit and I'm going to go for it. And maybe if you kill it, you do Killing Blow on it, you grant, it grants more bonus to your Blood Fury. That's the kind of a cool thing I would I would thought I, th I thought would be really nifty for the blood and maybe he even has a double passive um, in the same way that maybe the zealot has because I think that a majority of the the tier three um, hero selections have a second passive so I think a really cool second passive for the blood knight would be um, very similar to the zealot where once he's down, he doesn't. He pops back up and he's immune and he has increased damage. I think for the Blood Knight, rather than him popping him back up and being immune and having increased damage, he just comes back at like half health or a quarter health. So it's kind of play upon that notion that he is a vampire. He is already dead. You cannot kill. That is what is dead. That is what is dead is not truly die or whatever that H.P. Lovecraft quote is. So I think that'd be a really cool way to do the Blood Knight and the passive all in conjunction with that really cool alt and the white sword. So these are my kind of Heavy speculations on what I th what three, or I guess what one new character I would love to see in Vermintide 2. Um, if, if Fat Shark listened to this and said, yeah, sure, we're going to add it, I'd love to see how they implemented it and how they dealt with what I would look at as a very troubling way to do the weapons. I mean, originally I thought, okay, maybe for the ranged, we could do throwing axes and swords and daggers, but that's just dumb and a cop out and it's not really lore friendly or anything like that. So I think not having them have ranged and giving them more defensive or offensive capabilities kind of fits in a little bit better, I think. So if you guys like this and you guys have some ideas as to how you'd like to see these characters implemented, let me know in the comments, please, by all means. Uh, I'd love to kind of kick around some ideas with you guys. And I think, uh, uh, let me know some other heroes you'd like to talk about. Uh, Indie Pride and I were talking about like, oh man, how, how great would it be if there was like a black orc in the game? And how much diversity you would get from introducing a whole new subset of weapons like yeah sure a choppa is just an axe but there's a whole bunch of different ways that a orc would use it and a lot more brutal of an approach to the melee attacks and the melee attack animations than the other classes of obviously we wouldn't get a green skin because it doesn't make much sense from a lore perspective but again it, it's kind of a cool thing to explore like i i sure i could have done a video on what it would be like to have a chosen champion but it would have made a lot of sense because it's the main uh, antagonist of the game right so uh, thanks for watching so much for here today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this little video and, and foray down a uh, speculation lane of, hey, what would it be like if uh, Blood Knights were in the were in uh, uh, Vermintide 2? But again, I'd love to hear some of your ideas, what you guys thought of this. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And then, uh, if you have any other questions or if you do have any other ideas, please feel free to uh, let me know, guys. But thanks for watching. Have a good one and take care.